Good morning. Welcome to the last session of the week. What a session we've got for you on hashtag LDigiChat, leadership development in education online. It's been a fantastic journey this week, a whole range of different topics. And we're, today we're ending with Dr. Patrice Evans, who has been working for, I'm not allowed to use the word decades, but for many years within the Luton and Bedfordshire area and inspired generations of students and teachers alike. I'll give you a little bit more information about her later. Just to remind you, we are very active on Twitter today. There'll be lots to share. There was a photo posted last night of when Dr. Patrice uh, was with her class in 1991 at Cholney High School for Boys. Do pop over there, like it, uh, and uh, share your thoughts at Chilton TSA, at Chilton TSA. Go on there and follow us and share your thoughts about Dr. Patrice's topic area today, which is um, broader sense middle management. And we know how tricky that can be if those of you that have been through that or are currently in that role or looking forward to that role. Um, it's a challenging role in terms of, and we're looking specifically at heads of department which are the the cement and the foundations of where uh, our cultures are built within our schools. Without further ado, um, before we go live with Dr. Patrice, she's put together a presentation for you to watch and we're going to now play that for you. Enjoy. Good day, my name is Dr. Patrice Evans and I'm absolutely thrilled to have been asked to explore with you what makes an outstanding head of department. I'm sure like me, you've been listening to some of the webinars over the past few weeks and they're pretty cool. There's some excellent ideas, some of which I will reference during my session. So what makes an outstanding head of department? Is it as Shakespeare intimates in Twelfth Night, some are born great? Some achieve greatness and some have greatness thrust upon them. Come on, there really is no one size fits all answer to this question, is there? So rather than even try to give you a prototype, I'd simply like to share with you what I've noticed from my experience as a teacher, having worked with, coached, or mentored heads of departments, quality assured teaching, learning, and assessment in many schools over the years. These are what I've noticed. My plan is to explore what they do by focusing on three Ps. Aha, uh -huh. I know you want to find out what the three Ps are, but you've got to wait for a little while, okay? Before I get into the three Ps, I do have a little preamble. And it's based around that word outstanding. That word outstanding is quite value laden. And in today's modern day educational context has come to be associated with Ofsted judgments. Now, whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. And I'm just gonna park that now for my session. However, it is important for you to understand that within an offset inspection, no individual or department is ever given a grade. Whatever they do contributes to that holistic school judgment. So that word outstanding, when I use it, refers to how senior leaders, perhaps even external auditors, guided by offset judgments, have come to label an individual as outstanding based on what they've observed and based on their interpretation of the offset criteria. I would also argue that being outstanding is not a label, it's actually a journey. So I'm hoping that by sharing with you what I've noticed over the years, you will see how heads of departments who have been labeled outstanding have journeyed or worked their way towards that accolade. So I'll tell you what we do. Let's now take a look to see what I've discovered about outstanding heads of departments. One of the means by which Ofsted makes their judgment is via the department deep dive. Some weeks ago, Nadine Cotton presented a superb webinar on preparing for deep dives, which I won't rehash, there's no need to do that. But hopefully hers, along with the science, English and math sessions, have demystified what might seem like a scary process. With the outstanding head of department, however, while the initial process might have appeared to be scary, I have noted they were not afraid to use the opportunity to present the rich strategies they've implemented. And they chose the Ofsted visit to celebrate or show off the successes within their department. So the question is, what makes an outstanding head of department? What are those qualities that, by delineation, 
make them stand out positively. And this is where you finally get to find out about the three Ps. Look at this. One day while I was shopping, I came across this. It's a pod, isn't it? Yeah, and but when I open it, what do you think is going to be inside? Yeah, three Ps, right? And for the purpose of this presentation, the three Ps are being passionate, being practical, and being professional. Man, as an outstanding head of department, you gotta have passion. Oh, oh, sorry, wrong context. But an outstanding head of department loves their subject. You know what, sometimes it gets so busy ticking boxes that they forget this is crucial. Whether they're teaching in or out of their discipline, their passion for students and their learning is so evident. Results are extremely important. I mean, that's our bread and butter, but they rarely forget the goal is to support their students' access to FE or enrich their cultural capital. Having students raise their hands with excitement, eager to answer questions. Okay, I know, I know most of us have a no hands up policy, but you know what I mean? Don't you just love it when they're engaged and excited about learning? That's so cool. They love to see students become socially conscious, raising funds for different charities, demonstrating pride in their work, and even all grown up, modeling rich practice to others. This is what their passion is about. The manner in which outstanding heads of departments enthuse about their subject is palpable. They have energy and passion. So the message here is you gotta have passion. You gotta be happy about what it is you're doing. Now my second P, and perhaps the biggest part of this presentation, is being practical. Sometimes the educational challenges heads of departments navigate appear horrendously murky and puzzling, but the outstanding head of departments find a way. Marie Curie once said, nothing in life is to be feared, it is only to be understood. The outstanding head of department is not afraid to ask questions, they do not give up and blame others. Outstanding heads of departments make every effort to search diligently for answers. One way in which I've seen them do this is by understanding their school context. They talk to their line managers, they read internal and external reviews of their department and carefully scrutinize their school's IDSR. They are open to considering these views. I'm not saying that they necessarily um, agree with every single thing that is told to them, but they clearly listen and that's important. Remember, no man is an island, and the same is true of their department. They understand how the department is perceived within school and by stakeholders, and constantly strive to ensure this is positive. They have a vision, and the structures which underpin their goals are evident to all. For example, they are able to clearly map and articulate a student's learning journey, and there's a strong plan of action to guide that journey. Now, if you're thinking of becoming a head of department, remember there are lots of performers out there on the internet. Choose wisely though, and remember, whichever you choose, make it your own. This is your school, this is your context. Now, whichever is used, the head of department who stands out can clearly discuss why. Why they've chosen to implement an identified focus their, their reason might even be research driven. Now, this is an example of one that we use at our school, which we call a development plan. And I'll tell you why. Not only is there a strong link to school priorities, remember, your department is working with your school too on their journey. There's also a clear intent, and this intent is guided by a review of their practice. So for example, if in the IDSR it says that low prior trainers are not doing as well as others, their intent also indicates why that focus is there, very, very briefly. And then they show what it is they want to implement. Along with that, strategies are carefully discussed and selected and clear timelines indicated. Later on, of course, the impact is reviewed. By this clarity, they demonstrate their ability to work with their team to reflect and evaluate along with their capacity to drive improvement. And because heads of departments are passionate about students and their learning, 
I've noticed that the links before and after the key stages taught at that school are also evident and sustained. Their development plan or action plan is live, not a tick box exercise neatly filed away. It is dynamic and refined by feedback. Now, whether you're guided by Kolb's Learning Cycle or Christine Council's work on the curriculum, outstanding heads of departments triangulate. They check to see if strategies work, you know, why not? Have they worked in this context or in another context? And they refine their practice to suit. Regardless of which tracking system is used, outstanding heads of departments know their students. And I know you're gonna ask, well, how is this possible? Come on, I teach in a large comprehensive. Well, the outstanding head of department through regular focus meetings knows that their staff know their students or that they know key students. So the big question is how? How do they do all this? And you know what? The answer is so simple. I have noticed that the outstanding head of department demonstrates their own leadership skills, but by developing their team. Notice the focus is on team. They develop their team. Now you know something, Ofsted in their scrutiny of middle leaders, they said that people, not structures, are the most significant drivers of improvement and change in our schools. It then figures that the leadership skills employed are critical to the success of their team. Tell you what, let's take a break from me speaking for a while and look at a short clip in order to consider the issue of leadership. No, 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 no. It's not from a best-selling author on leadership, whoever that might be. Let's have a little bit of fun. This clip is from The Jungle Book and it's of Colonel Happy drilling the elephants. Tell me what you see. <clears throat> Let's get on with it. Dress up that line. Uh, pull it in, Winifred. Company! Right face! I'm so sorry I might have spoiled your enjoyment of this movie. I just thought we could relax a bit as we explored some ideas. So, so what did you notice? When we use Shine and Shine's model of leadership, we can see elements of minus one leadership and a bit of one. The poor elephants, oh bless them, they don't quite know what they're doing, despite or perhaps because of the rigid supervision and even being whipped into shape. Ouch. The leader expects to be followed simply because of the title. But who won the prize for spotting it? Have you? Come on, don't be shy. Did you notice? Did you notice the emerging level two leadership shown by Baby Elephant, who took time to explain, guide, and encourage Mowgli? Yep, well spotted. Now, there are so many models of leadership out there, whether you use Shine and Shine's model, which ranges from minus one to three, or perhaps Take a look at Maxwell's model, which is from one to five. I have noticed that outstanding heads of departments demonstrate qualities that range beyond level two. Now, if you look closely at Maxwell's model, you will see that at level two, the leader is no longer an eye specialist. 
They are in we mode. The shift has been made from them to others. This can be difficult because as leaders, we all want to impress our bosses. But I've noticed that the outstanding head of department recognizes that they cannot and will not shine without their team. At level three, leaders model attitudes and behaviors and set the standards. The morale of the team improves and so do results. Now, this might make the leader feel that they are great leaders, but Maxwell argues that the good leader will do things with and for their teams. At level four, they grow their staff, not throw them under the bus to look good. They use their influence to develop their leaders so that they in turn become leaders. I have noticed that outstanding heads of departments develop their team through the employment of distributed leadership, not just in title, but they support them to succeed in their roles. The downside, of course, is that you lose staff as they move on or take up other jobs, but that's also great. And the outstanding head of department appreciates that they're building a wider network. Finally, at the pinnacle, and listen, I need to tell you this, even Maxwell hastens to add, this is difficult to attain. So at the pinnacle, you have to leave a legacy. To summarize, I have noticed that outstanding heads of departments demonstrate a range of leadership skills, starting with aspects of level two, then beyond. But those who are more effective do not feel threatened by members of their team. And in fact, they make time for their staff, helping them become confident leaders, even within their own team. Theodore Roosevelt once said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I have noticed that if staff believe you only care about results, regardless of them, or consequences, the team suffers. Mary Myatt reminded us in her session that we are human beings first, then professionals. So while results are important, and trust me, they are, I have noticed that the outstanding head of department makes time to care for and build their team. Now, perhaps one or two of you are listening because you're moving into the new role of head of department. And if that's the case, make time to talk to each member of your team. That's what our standing heads of departments do. They make time. Who is the avid reader in the team? Who has been staying up late at nights caring for their newborn? Could this be why they're not as alert as before? Outstanding heads of departments remember to do this with their team. They make time. They take time to find out. Not so they can gossip, but because they care and because they want their team to be successful. So how do they do that? How do they build their team? Ah, can you remember when you were small? Can you remember when you were young? Itty bitty bit? When your parents taught you how to cross the street? Can you remember that? What did they ask you to do? Yeah, you got it. Stop, look and listen. And that's important. Sometimes you just have to stop, look, and listen. Now, random question here. Do you like gardening? Well, if you like me, it's gonna be, I ain't no gardener, definitely ain't a gardener. Rough translation, I do not have a clue what to do in the garden. When we first moved into our house, I was so puzzled about what to do. So I asked an elderly couple from church, you know, help, give me some advice. And they just said, stop, do nothing. And I thought, what do you mean do nothing? I gotta do something. And they said, no, do nothing. Do nothing for a year. Just tidy up, but do nothing. Don't dig up any plants. Don't buy any plants. Because it might be that you dig up something that's, a, that's really good, or you buy something that's already there. Take your time and do nothing. And then after a while, I thought, you know what? They're right. Plants are seasonal. So sometimes plants grow in one corner, and other times you might have something else popping up somewhere else. And what might look like a weed could actually be an exotic flower. So I followed their advice. And that's what I'm suggesting to you. So let's see. Now, heads of departments don't have a year, but the outstanding head of department makes time to stop 
and look at their team. They look at the dynamics, yes, but they look for the good. Come on, we're always going to spot the problems. It takes strength to look for and focus on the good, to look at the person who is a professional. Sometimes the looking comes via formal audits, though important, that's not what I'm recommending, certainly not initially. Truth be told, they see more on a day-to-day -day basis with drop-ins or within daily practice. They notice, even within perceived weaknesses, their strengths, and the outstanding head of department takes time to find or shape these nuggets. These in turn feed into distributed leadership, as staff are guided to recognize they are also leaders. These in turn shape rich PM objectives designed to grow staff even further and not to catch them out. They listen to what others have to say, what they really have to say. They ask questions of others, for example, their line managers, head teacher, or even other middle leaders. They are not afraid to ask and trial. They listen to what people are not saying. Come on, if a member of your team is always late, but only for your meeting, when there's no apparent reason, that in itself is a message. Now, there might be several innocent reasons for this, but in your heart of hearts, you suspect they don't really want to be there. Aha, uh -huh. I can hear you asking the question already. So let me tell you what I've seen other outstanding heads of departments do. Having looked at their team and found strengths, they then ask the colleague to lead on an area or share practice, but at the start of the next meeting. That colleague actually felt valued, unlike how they were made to feel by the previous head of department. I'm not saying everything turned out perfectly, but it was a start. So listen, that's important. Having taken time to stop, look and listen, I've noticed that outstanding heads of departments initiate structures and adopt a common and consistent approach to just about everything. Not as restrictions, but to ensure clarity of communication and, depending on where their team is, to quality assure minimum expectations. And though they might lead with the positives, they are not at all afraid to address concerns. Caring, yes, but challenging directly when the need arises. Now you might want to check Kim Scott's work on this. And challenging directly is not to be confused with constantly blaming. There's no point in constantly rehashing if the person is already stifled by their failure to get something right. Outstanding heads of departments sort things out and then move on. But I tell you what, let's not talk about heads of departments behind their back. I asked some heads of departments and other staff what qualities were demonstrated by outstanding heads of departments. And this is what they said. Hey guys, oh, lovely ideas. Come on, man. Come on, let's do them slowly and clearly, one at a time, okay? Identifying strengths within the team. Having a vision and working with my team to implement it. And respect for everyone in my team is critical and important. Not breaking confidence in my team members is key as it makes them feel valued and keeps them motivated. I do everything in my power not to break this confidence that is disrespectful and undermines staff. Trust and support for each other. For example, staff being able to see each other's lessons is very helpful, especially when someone else is teaching a subject or topic they are not familiar with. It's great to see the team develop. You have an open door policy so that anyone can walk in and observe each other. Delegating aspects of the department's vision. Having respect for each other. It doesn't mean you don't challenge when things go wrong, but you do that professionally. No blame culture. Keeping confidences, man. Who wants a head of department who blabs all the time? Sometimes you walk down the corridor and hear others talking about what you've just disclosed. So frustrating. Delegating or distributing the leadership so everyone in the department is part of the overall success. Supporting my staff to take responsibility and address their mistakes. Now those were some pretty good ideas, weren't they? As you can see, their focus is on others. And I've tried to capture a lot of what they said. Not everything, but certainly the things that kept being repeated time and time again. Things like respect, working together, seeing growth in each person. Now, you tell me now, what have you spotted? What's missing? 
yeah, results. Now, it doesn't mean at all that they ignored results. It simply means that they recognize that building a team is critical to success. Now, the last of my three Ps, and you'll be pleased to know is brief, is being professional. Okay? It's all about being professional. Many of us recognize these examples, which list some of the functional aspects of professional practice. You know, the sorts of expectations to which we've all become accustomed. For example, being reliable or objective, especially when setting and reviewing PM objectives, and having integrity. Now, most of these are outlined in the teaching standards, so nothing new here. But you know what I've noticed about outstanding heads of departments? Those heads of departments who stand out, they model those qualities that allow them to effectively build relationships and lead their teams. You know what? Often they're their own worst enemy, as they accept no excuses, not even of themselves. What's good for the team is also good for them. They take on the problems, and by doing so, they have a better understanding of what their team has to face. Now, you know the old saying, don't you? Actions speak louder than words. By modeling good practice, outstanding heads of departments lead by example and gain the respect of their team. They build trust. They may be confident in themselves, but they're equally confident about their team. They don't compete with their team. Come on, who does that? If a member of their team gets good results, then they celebrate just as well. I'll let you in on a little secret. As a head of department, their results are also your results. Now, there's a head of department who I absolutely love to talk to all the time. And every time I say something about a member of their team, you know, for example, they've done something superbly, and I say, you know what, that was so good, that was so exciting. They beam with pride. And they end up saying, you know what? What's great for them is even better for the team. And that's the attitude you tend to find from outstanding heads of departments. They do not belittle their team, either publicly or privately. As a leader, you will always have difficult conversations. And that's why it's so useful to rehearse what you want to say with someone else. They keep confidences. Unless there's a safeguarding concern or something very troubling, they will never repeat things that have been asked to keep private. So, at the end of the day, their team is able to trust and respect what they've been asked to do. A key thing to note here is that their team trusts them. Max Dupree, best known for his book, Leadership is an Art, says, earning trust isn't easy. He notes that it's also not cheap. Now, sometimes you might have to spend some money. I mean, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, he says that sometimes we have to get the basics Um, ready before we can move even further. And I've noticed that our standing heads of departments recognize this and listen to their team when they complain about things like um, rooming or heating or even resources. At the very least, they try to help. So that in itself might incur a cost to the school or to the department. But I suspect the greatest cost here is time. Dupree continues by reminding us that trust doesn't come quickly. I have noted that our stunning heads of departments build trust by being honest and giving constructive feedback, owning their mistakes. If someone in your team, for example, makes a mistake in practice, they double check to ensure that their instructions were clear or perhaps there might be a glitch in some part of the scenario. They, They really do take that time to check. I'll tell you what. Here's a little trick. Point your finger at the screen. Point your finger at me then, right? Okay, so you're pointing your finger at the screen. You sure? Good, feels uncomfortable, but that's fine. Take a look now at that same hand that you're pointing. What have you noticed? Yeah, there are three fingers pointing back at you. So the outstanding head of department takes time to double check what they have done before wading in to blame others. And in fact, They don't really spend a lot of time blaming others. They simply take the time to analyze what went wrong and to correct the mistakes. I have noticed that when the outstanding head of department admits to and takes responsibility for their own mistakes, it creates a safe environment and encourages their staff to do the same. Now, I've already quoted Mary Myatt, who asked us to see the person behind the professional. And of course, as a leader, 
especially one aspiring to be outstanding, you need to be the person behind the professional. And what Mary Myatt says is, don't leave the best of you at home. So while gaining trust can and might be difficult, taking time to earn it is a worthwhile endeavor. So I've now outlined my three Bs, you know, being passionate, practical, and professional. And what I've done is I've summarized some of my observations on this slide. So feel free to discuss, dispute, expand, or contract. Once it generates dialogue, it's all good. So what makes an outstanding head of department? Arthur Ashe, a well-known tennis player, you know, back in the day, he said, success is a journey, not a destination. I'd like to suggest that the same concept applies here. Being outstanding is a journey, not a destination. You know what? The problem with labels is that whenever we are labeled, we begin to think we have arrived. This is it. I'm good. I'm outstanding. So all is well. The reality is that's not true at all. The person who is labeled outstanding has already set very high standards for themselves and others, but recognizes there's still a lot more to learn. Hence, I believe it's a journey. Now, I would like to end with a, what appears to be an extremely random question. A little line up, as we say in Trinidad, you know, a little extra, or is it so random? There it goes. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be a shepherd? Can you imagine being far away from friends and family, caring for the sheep? Now, before you start to hate me, I'm not saying anything bad about sheep here, okay? I'm also not even referring to teachers of sheep, because we know that's silly. I would only like to focus on the shepherd in this analogy. So can you work with me just for a little while? Is that okay? A colleague of mine suggested there are three ways in which shepherds lead their flock. Some shepherds walk behind, as you can see in this first image here. Sometimes it might be great to lead from the back. It clearly suggests that the sheep know where they are going and what to do. But the strategy could also smack of too much surveillance and the fear of the big stick. Also, if the route, meaning the guidance from the team leader, isn't clear, it's then easy to blame the sheep if they stray. Some shepherds lead from the front. This connotes that you might be a trendsetter or innovative, creatively leading the way. But it might suggest that you believe the team doesn't have a mind of their own and can only get things done if they are led by you. Now that's a thought. Or perhaps that you're very competitive and only care about getting ahead at the cost of leaving your team behind. What I've noticed about outstanding heads of departments, however, is though they might at times be in front or at the back, their preferred position seems to be in the middle, walking with their team, working with their team, having some of the privileges with their team. The priest sums up my observations and three Ps quite nicely when he says, the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. You know, all that practical stuff that I referred to earlier. The last is to say thank you, while in between the leader is a servant. They work with their team. Not many people realize this, but the outstanding head of department does. You know something? In this day and age, when we're surrounded by so much uncertainty, it's reassuring to know that we are part of a team. That really does work. It helps. Now, you might be thinking that the outstanding head of the department must be a saint. Come on, you know that's not true. They get things wrong just like you and just like me. But remember what I said in the beginning? Being outstanding is a journey. I haven't actually met one head of the department who completely ticks every single box that I mentioned. All I'm doing is sharing with you those qualities that I've spotted over the years. But what I like is the fact that that outstanding head of department, that head of department who stands out from the rest, has several, if not most, of these attributes. 
and they constantly reflect on ways to develop even further. Hence the idea of a journey. And this is why I believe that being outstanding is a journey. It is not just an accomplishment. It is the learning along the way and to follow that matters. And it is that journey on which the outstanding head of department is willing to travel with their team. Now, thank you very much for spending some time with me and I hope you found the session useful. Again, I'd like to repeat that exploring this idea with you has been a privilege, an absolute privilege. It was great introducing you to my three Ps, okay? So remember, being passionate, practical, and definitely professional. I've added some pertinent references at the end of this PowerPoint, so please feel free to look at them, discuss them, and pursue them with your teams. But thank you very much for being part of my journey. Thank you. Welcome back. Just before I welcome uh, Patrice to the East Age, I just want to uh, reach out and say a special thank you to um, Muhammad Palmer, um, who helped create that fantastic presentation. And, and I know that he's been a, a massive support to Patrice and actually getting her message across in the way that she really wanted to. So thank you, Mohammed, for that. Um, Patrice, I met Patrice just under two years ago, and I regularly bump into her in the corridors when I uh, visit uh, Cholney High School for Boys. Um, it used to be by accident uh, before, now I do it with intent. I make a point of making sure that I find Patrice, even if it's just for that five minutes, no matter what your day has been like, she lifts you and I don't even work at the school. Patrice has worked in, and she, she won't thank me for saying this, uh, for decades in, in, in the Luton and Bedfordshire area, and she has inspired, truly inspired, generations of students through their difficult journey in education and, and is now for the last god knows how many years inspired our, our future leaders at a time when if you think back we think it's difficult now to coin a phrase under to do with under representation of ethnic minorities and how challenging that is dr patrice was teaching at a time when there was no mention of this. The Swan report had just come out and the Equalities Act hadn't been formed as, it, as we see it today. She was a lone voice, not only dealing with the challenges of education, but also dealing with so many other barriers. And it's a testament to her strength and resilience and her professionalism that she is where she is today and still inspiring people and students uh, in their journeys in education. So uh, what I'd like to do is just welcome Patrice to the E stage. There we go. Um, <laughs> forgive me for talking about the decades. But yeah, I, I told that, you not to say that. I know, but the thing is, <laughs> people need to know that when we have a figurehead like yourself within the community that we serve in the area that we're in, how important it is to have someone like you standing proud, whether it's in the middle, at the front, or at the back of that pack, <laughs> you are the role model and and the comments that i've had leading up to this session from people that you've taught people that you've inspired have, have really really taken me aback in terms of the numbers of people that you influenced over the over the many years and it is so important to actually mention that that we need people like you and if we had one of you and i'm sure there are people like you up and down yeah. the length of this country there are there are people like you but we need more of you um in every school um to make sure that the right voices get heard. So without further ado, Patrice, I'm going to let you say hi to everybody out there. <laughs> we had, we've got well over, we had a well ho uh, over 400 people dipping in and out. Um, so it's it, immense. And you were worried that you weren't going to know the Thank you very much for your kind words, Al. And may I just say thank you very much, everybody, for taking some time to, um, to dip in on the session. I know schools have started back, some more so than others. So I know this nine to 10 slot is quite um, critical, isn't it? Just settling things. So thank you for dipping in. Some really, really rich questions here. And yes. um, I thought I would start with the most obvious. Somebody asked, I think it's um, Lee. Um, you asked if you take away all the education context yeah. and these principles be applied elsewhere. And the short answer is yes. In fact, I would hasten to say that lots of things that we use in education have actually come from outside of education. For example, Kim Scott's work on radical candor. I mean, she worked at Google. So again, not necessarily the educational environment. 
um, not as we know it anyway, and yet we are using a lot of her work to help, um, help us shape the ways in which we deal with conflict or address situations. So um, there's somebody else I'm reading too, I think it's Lencioni. Sorry, apologies if I pronounced that wrongly. Um, but his work too in looking at the dysfunctions of teams, um, again, coming from outside of education, but quite applicable because at the end of the day, we're working with teams and teams are microcosms of society. So you're bound to have the same problems elsewhere. So that, that's a fairly easy one. So thanks for starting gently with me, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, do you want to jump to next? Yeah, there are one or two um, questions like, um, I'm, I'm, I, I took notes, you see? You're not the only one taking notes this morning. <laughs> I took notes, right? Somebody asked about um, how would you approach a team member who is not always um, willing to cooperate? Um, I, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, that seems to be linked to one or two other questions. You know, like you're taking over a new team. What do you do to make it your team? So they're sort of all um, wrapped into one. Again, if you look at it, if you look at your, your team as a class, I mean, if you're a teacher, if you're a teacher and you're listening, you would know that within your class, you have a whole range of people. Um, you have the three Ds, you know, the disenfranchised, those who think, well, you know what? Um, I have no part in this. The disaffected, the ones who feel negative, the ones who don't care. But the good news is that you also have people who do care, mm. but perhaps it might be the silent voices. Yeah. So you have to recognize that there's a whole team. And you, in order to be able to talk to this person who seems to be um, not working with you, I might recommend going with flow. Now, not with the flow, because clearly you want them to <laughs> listen to what you have to say. But going with flow, F meaning look at the facts. So talk to the person, make some time, talk to the person. Big Goddard, I think last week, he said, have a plan in hand if you're going to have difficult conversations. So plan ahead, know what it is you want to say, but also go in with an open mind. So that F for the flow is run with the facts as you know it. And I'm stressing that because my mom always said there are three sides to every story, <laughs> yours, mine, and the truth. Yeah. So somewhere in between <laughs> what you know, or what you think you know, what that person tells you, and what emerges might actually be the fact. And the second part of the flow, that word flow, is clearly to listen. You got to listen. Yeah. Um, I think, um, is it um, David um, Didao has the drop everything and read? Uh, maybe we could corrupt that a bit and say drop everything and, um, and listen because listening is so important. Um, it's amazing it, um, that when you say one comment, how many different people hear different interpretations of that comment. And if you look, refer back to my video, um, when I talked about listening, I was looking at not just listening with your ears, but actually listening with everything, seeing what people are saying, looking at the difference between what they're saying and how they're acting, how they're behaving. And when you listen, recognize that that person um, to whom you're speaking has the right to reply. So if you brought, let's say, concerns to the table, then that person has the right to respond and give their side of the story. And once you've done that as a starting point, looked at the facts, had that conversation, listened to what they've had to say, then you agree outcomes. Because at the end of the day, I don't think I know, and Harvey could correct me if I'm wrong here, but I don't think I know of any teacher who's gone into teaching thinking, I'm going to make my students fail, <laughs> or I'm going to really mess up. You know, we all have that one moral purpose in mind, and that moral purpose is to ensure our students are successful. Um, how we define success is a different conversation, but we all have that purpose. So once you have those outcomes in mind, what would you like to achieve? Timelines for achieving the outcomes, because clearly you're not trying to catch people out. Um, then you then move on to the, the W, which is working with them, you know, to help them achieve um, those measurable targets or the, even to do the follow up. Because part of being on that particular flow journey is being able to praise that person if they've made a difference if they made steps to improve on whatever your concerns were. So I think that acronym FLOW works for me, you know, remembering that balance, getting that balance right, but also praising and celebrating when Absolutely. success happens. I mean, I, I love the fact that um, 
the sessions that we've had leading up to yours are feeding into Excellent. the conversation yeah. as well. Because I think what that shows people that have tuned in and watch it on YouTube is, is the consistency of approach and the way that you engage with people and each other, and especially to a difficult uh, conversation like you talked, uh, talked about Vic Goddard. You know, it, it, it's simple in approach. It's not, a, it's not an easy thing that anybody wants to do but it definitely is simpler in approach in terms of deal with the facts, like you said. That moral purpose that you refer, you refer to, um, mm -hmm. that, that's at the centre of everything. And like you said, yeah. nobody really wants to go, nobody goes into teaching to <laughs> fail their students or their team. You know, that, no, that, exactly, that, exactly. That, you know. And in um, fact, being home now uh, has helped a lot of teachers recognise why they wanted to teach in the first place. Absolutely. It's quite frustrating. Yeah. It doesn't matter how healthy you are or not. Hmm. It is a bit frustrating being home because you know you want to get back in the classroom. Uh, of course, like, safely, so let's yeah. not make this a, a political comment, but yeah. you certainly want to interact with your students. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Where do we want to jump to next? Let's, let's, uh... There's a simple one. I think it's um, Sophie who asked the question yeah. about... Um, yeah, now, yes. Yeah. Yes, if you're line managing, uh, so you're now becoming a head of department, but the person who is your line manager used to run the department and the person is still in the department. What do you do? So, okay, well, you could pray. That helps initially. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It comes right back to open, um, caringly frank conversations. Talk to the person because, um, Sophie, whatever it is you're experiencing, that other person is also concerned about it. So I think you need to clear the air. Um, I'm sure there's no problem. There's no issue but have a frank conversation with that person. I've been in exactly your shoes and I've been on the other side of it. And what I, if I had been on the other side of the coin, what I've done is I've taken the, um, the new head of department aside and I've, I've explained that I will never, never publicly undermine or even behind their back undermine um, whatever it is you're doing. So I think just talk to the person, and agree how you plan to do things because accountability works. And I'm still, again, as I've said, I did listen to quite a few sessions before. And Vic Goddard gave the example of somebody who was a friend of his and with whom he had to raise an issue. And he, he just put it out there and he said, you know what, we're good friends, but can we have a professional conversation? And that worked quite well. So I think if you just talk, anytime you start to feel uncomfortable or, or they feel uncomfortable, I think you can both agree um, mm. to, to discuss things. Yeah, and I think uh, when you start compensating for that re relationship and start acting in a different way, yeah. sometimes you instigate a different behaviour because of exactly. the way that you uh, have entered that conversation. And, uh, and I think that's actually vital. I've got, uh, can we jump to um, Sophia? So she, what Sophia said is, as an NQT, where do you get the skills to become a subject leader in a small school? Well, you know what? <laughs> you've, you've sort of answered your own question. That word small school says it all. Because once it's a small school, you become the jack of all trades, don't you? Um, when I first became a head of department, um, I ran, I, I, I think I became head of department um, within three months of teaching. And why? <laughs> there were only two of us. And I happened to be the one that was hired before the second person. Uh, but that school was also quite small. And what you find is because it's small, you're actually best placed to observe, to, to talk to people, um, to work with stakeholders, look at other middle leaders, to see what they're doing, and to volunteer. I think to initially volunteer. I know sometimes, and I, I don't want to sound like my grandparent, you know, you young people, you want to rush into things. Sorry, I'm not saying that. I'm just joking. But sometimes um, we, we, we forget that it's important to wait. And I think as you wait, you can look and see. But as you wait, you can also volunteer and work with others. And as you work with others, you can learn the skills. So to be honest, I think you've, you've sort of answered your own question. By being in a small school, it's going to happen at some point in time. Anyway. Yeah. I, I really want to go to uh, a question from, from Omar Malik. Uh, okay, it's Omar sure. from Saudi Arabia. He said, a nostalgic presentation, to say the least, from having Mrs. Evans as my English teacher back in the 90s. Oh. Um, <laughs> watching clips from the Jungle Book childhood favorite uh, he said excellent presentation about the qualities of uh, 
head of department. The question that he, uh, he's asked, and I think mm-hmm. is quite pertinent to the, our current situation, we've touched on it in, in a lot of sessions and today as well, with the current pandemic and sudden changes to teaching approaches, especially online, what practical advice can you give heads of departments to deal with such changes, especially when these changes are new to the workplace? Would it, uh, would it be good to introduce a couple of our uh, more Ps to deal with this, these challenges. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I can only hold three Bs in my pod here, right? <laughs> but if you invite me to Saudi Arabia, I can probably change a piece, a different set of Bs. Um, no, good question, actually. Um, but you know what? The, I think one of the critical things to remember is that you are not alone. Um, if, if you are in a school, you're head of department, that you're part of a team. And because of this pandemic is outside of us, <laughs> outside of anything that anybody ever imagined. Schools have had to work on policies. They've had to work on shaping what to do. So if I can give you an example, let's say from my school, within um, two to three days, we are already working out how do we learn from home? How do we interact with students? How do we um, look at things? Um, Our safeguarding lead was quite clear in directing us. I'm a deputy head, but our safeguarding lead was equally clear in directing me regarding how we actually shape learning at home. So the first thing to remember is something like that, which supersedes any one of us, is not about an individual response. We come right back to that word team. We are not eye specialists. We don't need to go to spec savers. So we work as a team to shape responses. And once you've done that, you follow those protocols. But But again, if we then bring it down to department level, that critical word trust is so important even more so now when people are so uncertain about things. Having a say, asking people what's going on, double checking that everything is okay, being that person behind the professional. Uh, You know what, I had to laugh when Mary Myatt said that some time ago, and I think Kim Scott also says the same. Um, Years ago, things have, I mean, things have changed, haven't they? Years ago, when you started teaching, you felt you had to be this, uh, somebody really strong and sturdy. And now we are saying, yes, be strong, yes, be steady, but also be kind. Also be the person who you are. So I think within this pandemic, it's important to reassure your team that you have their back and vice versa. If it's a really healthy team, that they have no problem with doing the same, to be honest. So talk, talk to each other, find out who's had to stay up late because a child is sick or they're worried about a grandparent who might be ill. And once you are talking, you could then reshape any protocol or practices that you've agreed to ensure that the team works uh, quite coherently. Uh, I'm hoping I've answered your question. I think think you've answered uh, very comprehensively. I think (laughs) think none of these none of these are single sentence answers in terms of the the quite in depth and the the topic area that we're looking at. Because this is we're dealing with people. Um, We're not dealing with like you said structure. These are people that we're dealing with, and I think it's it's important to recognize that uh, and I think as Mary said as well, be human first and you referenced it as well, is that have that human to human interaction. And whether it's in the current situation where we're a little bit more virtual, uh, a lot more virtual, um, or whether you're actually back in school, uh, actually having building, building that trust, building that relationship, being human first, I think is absolutely vital. And, and that, that applies now more so than ever before. Now, we are getting towards the end of our session, Patrice, and you're worried that how are we going to fill this time? We've got tens of questions there that, <laughs> that we didn't even get a chance to dip into. So what I'd like to do, Patrice, is thank you. And you know that we could have spent hours today. <laughs> Uh, literally hours. I mean, this could have easily been a two hour session and it would have felt like half an hour. So from that point of view, I just want to thank you. Uh, immense amount of effort, immense amount of effort putting that together for such a vital part of the jigsaw in our schools in terms of that middle management position and how crucial and vital it is and that we inspire the best out of the people that lead those positions. So thank you, Patrice. And thank you very much, Arv. Arv, what I've done, I know in some of the slides I've summarized some ideas, but I've also put together one little crib sheet. Yeah. Somebody asked about the top three tips, and yeah. I, I, I think I've worked with a colleague this week to come up with about eight to ten tips. So I'll be quite happy to email you um, yeah. this. And we can share that then, out as well. Yeah, please. Quite, yeah. quite happy to do that. Yeah, no, and, that's and, 
Yeah, can I also say to everybody, when I said it was a privilege, I genuinely meant that. The thing about when you ask to do something like this as a senior leader is everybody think everything is perfect. You know, like the child who gets this lovely birthday present, but they forget how hard their parents have had to work to get that money to buy the present. The reality is that we all are learning. So having been asked to do this, I've had to learn to shape this in a way that I, well, I hope has been palatable for everyone. So thank you very much for that opportunity. Just like everything else you do, absolutely spot on. <laughs> absolutely spot on, Patrice. Um, and, uh, and, and it doesn't come without effort, I've got to say. Um, none of this is easy, um, but you've done a fantastic job today. And, uh, and I know that people want more from you. So I'm sure we're going to have you back doing more of this <laughs> <laughs> now that you're a seasoned expert in this uh, oh, doing the virtual sense. <laughs> um, so thank, you, thank you so much. End of another session, uh, end of another week. And uh, there seem to be flying past. The landscape out there is changing as we speak. Uh, primary schools went back this week and their plans are afoot and they're implementing strategies and how they're going to cope with different challenges they now face um, and having their students back in. We, we're now actively planning for our year 10s and 12s to go back in and again um, similar challenges but uh, at the core of everything that we do our moral purpose is to make sure that we deliver the best that we can to the students um, that we have in our care and I think we've done that all the way through this pandemic and we will continue to do so afterwards as well. So a well done to all of you for giving up the time this morning sharing your thoughts and engaging with us. I have a challenge for you is this it's a little bit of a shallow challenge I know it is uh, I was going to come on this morning and say oh we want to get to 900 YouTube um, subscribers sadly that target's already been met so this session is recorded and I know that you want to share this one by the end of today if we can get anywhere near a thousand subscribers and I know that we've got 300 people 400 people at one point uh, on this session if you haven't gone onto our YouTube channel can you go on there and subscribe it'd be absolutely amazing for me to wake up tomorrow morning and say that we've got a thousand subscribers what that means for us is, is that our uh, material gets noticed it gets pushed out there and gets used and the end point for that is is that everybody benefits so the more you engage with us the better it is the other challenge i've got for you is could you please go on to uh, twitter at chilton tsa we want to hit 3,000 followers by the end of today and i know that some of you are very active on there some of you have started to use it if you've got an account jump on there and follow us at Chilton TSA. If you haven't got an account, set one up and you can engage with Dr. Patrice online as well. And she's got so much to share with you. Um, so this is me signing off for another week. And I want to uh, just reach out and say, stay safe, enjoy the weekend. We will see you again with a fantastic lineup next week of hashtag LDEduChat, leadership development in education online. Thank you.